Good to see everybody. Y'all pull your mask down just a second and smile at me so I can see you're under there. Thank you. That's so nice. That mask, it may be protecting us, but it is a cover-up of your faces. So it's nice to see your smiling pearlies under there. Let's go back to our text this evening. Mark chapter 15. If you have your testament, you will appreciate making some notes there. We do a printed thing in the bulletin. Uh, I don't know if that is working for you or not. I would be curious to have a little feedback from you about that, uh, whether or not it's helpful or not helpful. Uh, the outline is a piece of paper, and this is the hardest part about this process. I mean, we came here to learn. So for you, what has to happen for you is the best method for learning. What's the best method for learning something for you? Is it something that looks like this? Or is it you taking notes yourself in a physical notebook that you can keep up with? Is it you, you know, absorbing yourself in the text while we are studying and talking? That should be a goal for you. If you are coming... I, I'm not saying that you can't learn this way. I'm just saying if the only resource that you're relying on in this moment where we are investigating God's word is your ears, then it's going to be a lot more challenging for you to leave with the content of what we are striving to learn together. If you don't engage it, with your eyes in your own text, whether it's in your phone or your paper Bible, then it's just not going to be as likely to stick, especially when we are trying to uh, think about such a great subject as our Lord's crucifixion. Uh, I am the same way. I have to write stuff down because I'm not going to remember it. I don't care who it is. That's saying it, uh, it's not personal to the speaker for me, or it shouldn't be personal to whoever speaking for me to take notes because it helps me listen to that person more efficiently, and I will recognize certain trends as I write things down and follow ideas. So I just encourage you, I don't know if this is you know the best method for you. I would like to hear back from some of you, uh, maybe if there is a better method or if we can improve on that system. Anyhow, you can share some reflections. We're in verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus was passing by on his way in from the country. And there they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place, the place of the skull. And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, the other on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. 
In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe him. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near this heard this, they said, listen, he is calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to get him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. I want to think with you about the idea of the sign, and I want to kind of play off of that. The sign that Jesus had hung over his head said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. There are certain facts that do not appear in all four Gospels when you are looking carefully into the intricate detail of the crucifixion. This detail is recorded in all four. That there was a sign hung in some kind of way written that said, Jesus, King of the Jews. We learn from John chapter 19, verse 20 and 21, that that notice was written in all of the present modern languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So Pilate wanted as many people as possible to be able to read the sign. But it's interesting what is written on this particular sign because the Jews go back and they protest to Pilate. And they say, don't, don't write that he's actually the king of the Jews. Go, go make a corrected form of this and say that he claimed to be. Not that he really was, but that he claimed to be. Well, even from the Jewish perspective, I can understand why they would say that. They didn't believe that he was the king of the Jews. And so that's what prompts them. And they return and go back and stand before the, go the governor. But he refuses to change his mind. The hand of God is in the physical sign. The physical sign, the physical in inscription that is written. God is involved in that. And even though there is some kind of mild protest, that which accompanies visibly in all of these accessible, a multitude of languages is read by all those who pass by. Jesus, King of the Jews. That's powerful. In verse 27, 
they crucify him with two rebels, one on his right and the other on his left. And it says in verse 29 that those who passed by hurled insults. Now watch what they want. It's really important that we understand what they are saying because we're going to examine it. Those who pass by hurl insults, shaking their heads and saying, well, who might this crowd be? Well, certainly it's going to be of the chief priests because we're going to see that they jump in on this bandwagon. But this is also some of that crowd that has been routed up by their intent. Possibly some influence of the Romans who have already begun to mock him with the royal robe and the crown of thorns and these various things that suggest their mockery of his being a king over and against Caesar. So there's a lot of political pressure that's happening, and that's what's bringing these comments out. But I want you to notice specifically what they say they will do. So you who are going to destroy the temple in three days, I'm sorry, the, destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. That's what they want him to do. They want him to save himself. One little simple thing. Come down, save yourself. That's what they're asking. Well, there's something behind that, even uh, a little bit more in 30 and 31. In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law mocked him, he saved others, but he can't save himself. In other words, if it is so that he was able to save others, the evidence is that he can't save himself now. Because if he could, then he would. Verse 32, let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross. Underline this or circle some kind of way to get your attention to it in that text. That we may see and believe. You hear what they're saying? They are making a bargain with Jesus. If you will show us a sign, if you will just raise somebody from the dead, we will believe you. Oh, I got one. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. If you could cure a man who was actually born blind, now, that would be a great one. Then we would believe you. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, I got one. If you could take a little boy's knapsack. Serious. Think about it. If, if you could take a little boy's knapsack and feed 5,000 people with leftovers, we would believe you. If you could walk on water. If you could walk on water, and that would be legit, we'd probably believe you. You could hush the wind. We would believe you. Do you see what they're saying? They're not really saying, even in this moment, has nothing to do with whether or not he is able to sign them something. The issue is not a lack of a sign. The issue is they don't believe the signs he's already done. They don't believe. And that's why they act like they are acting. Jesus Christ Additionally, not only did he cure physically literal thousands, he expelled demons. 
demons who had physical control over a person. You remember Legion? When that moment happened in Mark 5, and Jesus expelled those demons, those demons rushed into those hogs, you remember? And all those hogs ran down into the water and died. Well, when the people came from the town and they found the guy who had all those demons inside of him in his right mind, they asked Jesus to leave. People couldn't handle his signs. How do you explain that? He's walking on the water in the middle of the night, approaching his disciples who are not boat novices. In the middle of the night, he approaches them walking on the water, and immediately the boat reaches the shore where they were trying to go and couldn't get there because the wind was buffeting their boat. Can't explain that. He touched a coffin and raised the woman's son to life and gave him back to his mother. He was the fulfillment of scripture. Hmm. There are so many passages that you could look at. I want us to think about one in connection to this comment about Elijah. The, the crowd kind of allows for this possibility of Elijah to come back and help Jesus in some kind of way. So I want us to look at a, a couple of places just for a moment. Let's look at two or three places. Let's go to John 1 first. John 1, 21. John 1, 21. The people come to John the Baptist. The Jewish leaders uh, are, this is the testimony. Now, there was a, a man named John. Uh, John's testimony with the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask who he was. He did not fail to confess freely, I am not the Messiah. Then they said, are you Elijah? Now that's important. They, they know that somebody named or, or thought of as Elijah was going to come. Hold your finger right there and run back to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, in the last chapter. Just flip back there. Right in front of Matthew, the last book of the Old Testament which happens to be Malachi. Uh, this is verse 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. All right, so Malachi knows this guy is coming. He foretells that. Then we go into this period of silence for several hundred years. John shows up, and the people say, hey, are you the Elijah? Now, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Matthew 17, beginning in verse 10. The disciples ask him, uh, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Now, there's something special about that. 
And Jesus replied. Okay, wait, before we read the reply, let's look and see who he's talking about. Look at verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Okay, now let's go back and read what Jesus says with that knowledge. And let's say John's name when we come across that. Beginning of verse 11, Jesus said, to be sure, Elijah comes. That's the one that's prophesied by Malachi and will restore all things. But I tell you, John has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him, John, everything they wished. Now, you know what happened to John, right? They beheaded him. Now watch what Jesus says in connection to this Elijah who was to come. In the same way. Don't miss that. It's prophetic. And you just cannot rush out and say that about yourself. I thank you, Mr. Beavers, for reading from John 7. Because what Mr. Beavers read to us was this. Everything Jesus said was totally and completely the will of his Father. So what's happening here is Jesus is revealing who Elijah is, and that he is going to suffer in connection to that. Do you see the testimony? Mm. There's all this testimony that comes from the scripture. Uh, there are too many things for us to look at to even really get the full scope of all of what is happening. But there is this connection. The people here in, Matthew, in Mark 15 are confused. They didn't listen to the teaching of Jesus. Now, they're right to think about the Elijah, but Jesus has already identified him, and he said that Elijah was John, and they killed him, and that same thing is going to happen to me. That's a sign. It's a prophecy. It's a word that people did not know concerning the life of Christ until it was revealed to him by his father. He revealed it, and what he revealed was truth. There are all of these physical signs. There are scriptures signs things that he would have to fulfill additionally at noon in verse 33 darkness comes over at noon anybody remember the was, wasn't it when we wore uh, those glasses for that eclipse was that a full eclipse somebody remind me Shake or nod. Was that a full eclipse when we were wearing those glasses? One of them went in front of the other. And it happened during the daytime. It, it was dark, but it didn't look dark, like real dark. Darkness comes over the whole land. In the middle of the day, how does that happen? It doesn't happen unless... God is involved in it. The temple is torn from top the curtain in, in verse 38. Uh, the, the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. Go back and read about that temple curtain and read when uh, they are making all of its specifics and find out how thick that temple is it is not like your shower curtain it is a huge heavy thick strongly woven solid piece of fabric torn 
from top to bottom. It would be the equivalent of you being able to tear a phone book that's that thick from top to bottom. God uses those signs. Additionally, in Matthew 27, you can read about the earth being shook, rocks splitting, tombs being opened, and the bodies are raised that are in those tombs. And those bodies go and appear to many people in the holy city and testify that this is what is happening. Jesus is he is a sign. That's what's so ooh about this. They are sticking a stick at him and saying, hey, if you would just do a sign, just come down, just come down, show us up, make it interesting, save yourself. But already to the maximum, Jesus had revealed himself as to who he was and every sign that he did was an example of God working through him. This is the testimony of it. In verse 37, the loud cry, Jesus breathes his last. Remember John 10, I lay down my life. No one can take it from me. Nope. Nobody's powerful enough. No cross is cruel enough. No blood loss is evident enough, he is going to lay down his life. That command, again, he says in John 10, I received from the Father. I have received the command to lay my life down, and I also have received the command to pick my life can't destroy him. You cannot destroy him. <laughs> he, he is the potter. How dare the clay think that is as imaginable as some wild, crazy idea. It's not possible. The potter does not have power over the clay. The, the clay doesn't have potter power over the potter. It's ridiculous and embarrassing. This is what happens. So let's make some application. Here's uh, application number one. People don't listen to what is written. People don't listen to what is written. Here, here is written Jesus, the king of the Jews. It's written in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. And the people refuse to hear it. God has written about Jesus. John 5, remember this testimony while he is sort of dealing with some Jews who are questioning him? In John 5 and verse 39, he says two things in John 5. He says, you study, verse 39, the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. 
in order to come to Christ, you must recognize that you need life, which means you must recognize that you are dead in your sins and that he is the only way for you to attain the life that is the abundant life, the life that's truly life that he promised to bring. Additionally, in verse 45 of that same chapter, he says, don't think that I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses on whom you have set your hopes. If you believed Moses, you would believe me for he, listen to how personal it is, he wrote about me. God wrote about his son, Jesus Christ. He is on every page of the Old Testament. You can even see his blood splattered in the Old Testament through all these images that concern him. Jesus knew that God wrote about him. This sign was written. It was written. I suggest to you that God is the one who is writing this sign. And there is no one who is going to change what is written. It is the same way today. God has written and men refuse to hear it because we are so full of our own selfish ambition. We are so enthralled by our pleasures. We don't want to hear what God says. We don't want to be serious about what God says. We want it to be simple. We want it to be easy. We don't want it to challenge. Nothing about following Jesus Christ falls into those categories. Serving Christ is everything that your life is. It's all demanded. It's all demanded. Our intention from Mark 15 is to respect what is written. Men, how much of this is in your home? However much of this is in your home, however much of this is in your personal life, will reflect the level of respect that you have for what is written. God speaks. We do the hearing that's our goal that's our objective and that's our command all of these signs that Jesus did uh, it just blows my mind that this group of people were up against all of this mound of traceable circumstances. Do you know that on the day when Jesus died, Lazarus was still alive according to all of our indications? He dies in chapter 11 and he's raised. Jesus quickly thereafter goes to his death. More than likely, Lazarus, who had tasted of death, was still alive and nearby. 
how many of the Sanhedrin, how many of the leaders took time to talk to Lazarus? You see how they dealt with the blind man in John 9. Healed by Jesus Christ, they know it because the whole community is rejoicing. This guy had been born blind. I mean, it wasn't like an accident where he got struck by lightning, had a wreck, you know, then lost his sight. Jesus kind of got it back, jogged it right. I mean, a, a number of things can be excused in a case like that. But a boy born blind who's never seen the light of day, who's never looked at his mom, saw his mother for the first time that day, and they had a massive inquiry about that and rejected the evidence. Signs do not, that's why signs are a part of the package, but they alone are not the package. They alone are not the sole thing. The signs verify the teaching. The signs, ver they qualify the one speaking as having authority. You cannot come upon a man controlled by a demon so that he has been mute, unable to speak. Everybody in the town knows it. You can see what happened to him. He was probably a talker at one point. The demon comes into his body and seizes control of his vocal, of his tongue. Jesus has power over that. And yet, there is question. All those questions and all those issues, they all stem from unbelief. So when you're talking to somebody about Jesus Christ and this moment, the miracles of what happened in relation to the cross are important. Those details are important. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been recorded. But even still, the miracles themselves are not the message. The message is about what he said, how he dealt with people, how he lived, how he showed God's mercy, how he taught these principles for us to live by. The signs verify it, they qualify it, they stamp it. Okay. Oh, I love this. Uh, Hebrews 8. Let's close with this. I looked up the word. Uh, if you're reading King James, this is what your Bible reads in Mark 15. Let's go to Hebrews 8. If you're reading King James, this is what your Bible reads in Mark 15, and I think it's 25, where they're talking about they have uh, a notice that's written. King, King James says... Uh, a superscription of his accusation was written over. That's the term, how it's worded in the King James. The NIV just says there was a, a written notice. The word there, the word there means to inscribe, to write on or over. Epigrapho, that's the word. 
it's used only a handful of times. And I want to tell you what those are. One of those times is in Acts 17, which you are familiar with, where uh, Paul comes into Athens and he finds an inscription to the unknown God. Remember that? That's the same word that is used for the word written notice in the NIV or this uh, written over in the King James. That's the same exact word. A second appearance happens in Revelation 21 and verse 12, where the New Jerusalem is being described, and it refers to the fact that names written there in connection to the city. Names are written there. Then there are two other places both in the book of Hebrews, and they both say in intrinsically the same thing, although one is in chapter 8, the other is in chapter 10. I'll show them both to you, but please make a note. This is a delicious meditation. The Hebrew writer is talking about the new covenant, which, of course, out of Mark 15 comes as a result of Jesus dying. Verse 7. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another, but God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to me uh, or to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, here it is, and write them. That's the expression. Write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, right outside that verse, I want you to put chapter 10 and verse 16. Because it's going to say basically the same thing. And it's the same word that's used there that's used here. What you're looking at when God says, I will write over, I will write on, it's the exact mirrored picture of the word that Mark chooses to use to describe what happened in the inscription process in relation to the cross of Jesus Christ where it was written, where it was inscribed on the sign Jesus King of the Jews. Okay, so let's think about that just a second. In verse 13, he, he talks about, well, let's just finish verse 11 and follow him. No longer will, I'll be their God, they'll be my people. Uh, no longer will they teach their neighbor or anyone say to the other, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sin no more. Now, draw a line from 13, circle the word new, and draw it back to that little expression, right, them. Draw those lines connecting. By calling this covenant, the one we're talking about, the one where? 
where God is going to write like was done in relation to the name of his son. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. And he goes on, the whole book is written to try and show the superiority of this new covenant. Jesus is the way God inscribes on my heart and my mind his laws. Jesus Christ is the way that happens. But it is very worthy of consideration to see that the same word that is used to describe this process here in 8 and in 10 is the exact same word that is used to describe the process where the sign was inscribed, where it was written on in these languages. God writes on us, our hearts, through Jesus Christ, his will. Well, how does that work? Because if I am a sheep and I trust what Garrett read to us at the top of the hour, that Jesus Christ never spoke of his own doctrine, but only reveal the truth that he learned from God, then we can know everything that Jesus said is God's will for my life. Everything. Whew. The cross is powerful. I pray that each one of us will not just be motivated. If all you are is motivated by the cross, I don't mean to hurt you, but you're missing something or you're immature. You are owned by the cross. Paul says, I am compelled by the cross of Christ. I, I don't have a choice. Motivated, like every other day, like on good times up there, yeah. Um, there is not a place for me to go. There's not a thought I can think. There's not a word I can say. There's not a day I can plan. There's not a moment with my children that is not lived in view of the cross and how that places me in relationship to God and my Lord. No wonder the Hebrew writer was so excited. <laughs> if I could say that he is like clapping, just please permit that suspicious interpretation. It's not written, but it's exactly the essence. This is new. And it's connected to the cross of Christ. That's why Paul said, I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm. May we ever be more and more in line with that idea. Tonight, if you need to respond to God's invitation and come to the foot of the cross, come to the foot of the cross. 
Hmm. We want to help you and encourage you. Your shepherds want to help you and encourage you. God wants to help. So we designed this song to be sung to give you a chance to think about your life. It's at a new year. Oh, that our theme for every day would be meditation on the cross and what it has done for me, thinking about me, for you. If you need to come to Jesus, respond now as together we stand and sing this song.